Welcome to another episode of Code for Thought. The supercomputer called Jean Zay can be found on the campus of Université Paris-Saclay, about 60 kilometers south of Paris. In June this year, 2023, I made my way there to meet with Nathan Cassaro and Hatim Bourfoun, who both work at IDRIS. IDRIS stands for Institute for Development and Resources in Intensive Scientific Computing, and it's part of the French National Research Centre, CNRS. Natam and Hatim are part of a team that works on Bloom, an open-source large language model used in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Of course, we've heard a lot about large language model this year, including, of course, ChatGBT by OpenAI. But in contrast to the commercial models, Bloom wants to make the model available to a wider public, be that AI practitioners, researchers, or indeed other companies. Bloom has been set up by an initiative called Big Science involving researchers as well as the company Hugging Face, and it has over a thousand contributors. And the large language model and datasets have been created with the help of the Jean Zig supercomputer at Idris in Paris-Saclay. Why supercomputers are needed to create and develop large language models is one of the topics I wanted to discuss with Nathan and her team. Bloom, of course, is not the only project they work on, because AI and machine learning are being used in a variety of different research areas, like, for instance, medical imaging. And we touch on that briefly, too. So here now, my conversation with Nathan and Hatim. Hello, everybody. We're here at Idris in the south of Paris. And uh, with me here today is uh, Nathan and Hatim. And I let them introduce themselves. So maybe you first, Nathan. I'm Nathan. So I'm wor- I've been working uh, at Idris for the last two years. So I am an uh, artificial intelligence engineer. Mm-hmm. At first, uh, I have a diploma in electrical engineering, but then I, I switched to uh, artificial in- intelligence uh, when I went in uh, the UK uh, for uh, a master degree. But then I've been working uh, for Idris and uh, it added a new uh, component uh, like high performance computing, which is very important for artificial intelligence, but, uh, which uh, I did not know uh, about before uh, coming here. And which is why we're talking today. So, but yeah. uh, anyway, okay. Hatim. So, hello, my name is Hatim Borfoum. As Nathan, I'm a research engineer in artificial intelligence here at Idris for the last two years, like, like Nathan, actually. I have a background in statistical, well, industrial statistical i'll say and then i switch to ai at my uh, first year of working so i learned by myself ai and then uh, i did some projects and then i joined idris can i just ask out of curiosity how did you learn ai by yourself yes so i discovered ai actually uh, at my engineering school mm-hmm. so we did statistic and we saw a bit of machine learning there so it's when I discovered it and I really liked it. So I kept in my mind that maybe I want to switch in that area. Then when I decided to switch to that area, I did several uh, mock online. I followed the very famous mock of Andrew, 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 Andrew and G. Yeah, yes, from exactly. Yeah, so, the so I started like that. <laughs> then I did several other uh, mock online like i I can't remember (laughs) there was too many (laughs) then i started to work on project on uh, kago so which is a competition uh, website Mm -hmm. you know that hosts a competition about ai and then i apply uh, to pi school which Mm -hmm. is program that allow um, engineer researcher to work on challenging project on ai which Mm -hmm. was my real how can i say work And then I joined Idris. Okay. Uh, Maybe we can start off with the kind of projects that you're currently working on. We're working on uh, multiple projects and uh, as uh, multiple fields. So currently Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working with Paris Brain Institute. Basically, uh, one of their team is uh, developing uh, software to allow researchers to use uh, deep learning. It's mostly used for research for the Alzheimer's disease, but Mm -hmm. it could be used for, in theory, any brain disease. Mm-hmm. And basically, they needed uh, Idris's help um, to speed up their code because uh, researchers do not have uh, the high-performance computing uh, skills that can be required to not waste time and maybe uh, distribute their code on multiple graphic cards. 
another project. So this project, uh, I've been doing it uh, without Hatim. It's uh, my project. I'm the only one really? doing it. Uh, but we also have a shared project, which was about evaluating uh, a large language model, Bloom, mm -hmm. which was trained here. And yes, that's uh, the two projects uh, which I've been working on uh, for the last uh, three months. So as uh, Nathan said, I'm working on the Bloom project. So actually the evaluation part mm -hmm. of Bloom. And also another project, which means to make Bloom easy for researchers. Because Bloom is a very big model that it's hard to train again, to fine tune. And we try, uh, so with Nathan, to uh, make the fine tuning part of Bloom easy for some researcher. It's a project that is linked to the evaluation of Bloom. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, well, recently, so a few months ago, I did PlugAI, which is a project mm -hmm. in collaboration with Creatis, which is a um, laboratory specialized in medical study. And uh, the aim of that was to create a framework that can do segmentation on medical image. Easy for uh, like um, people who are not used to use AI or the framework that it needs. Maybe we can start talking about Bloom. Perhaps you can introduce the project quickly, what that is. There is also an article on Archive, which I'm going to share in the episode notes, but maybe you can give kind of a high-level introduction. So uh, Bloom is a large language model. Bloom is not the first large language model to be trained, mm -hmm. but um, usually uh, large language models were trained by private companies like uh, OpenAI, Google DeepMind or Facebook. And they would keep the uh, neural network for themselves. So maybe they would share the topology of the network, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't share the weights and uh, what comes uh, out of the training process. So the hyperparameters. Uh, 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 yeah, they would give the hyperparameters, but they wouldn't give the weights, Okay. Uh, which is uh, the most important thing. Mm. The issue is that large language models would be only for very big companies, mm -hmm. and uh, we wouldn't know exactly how it was trained. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would also uh, make uh, research about large language models much slower because many researchers would try to use them, but they do not have access to them. They cannot change them. It does make it very difficult to understand. There are not that many uh, large language models, so it is difficult to understand how they, how they work exactly and uh, why they work. And if you cannot try things to understand, then uh, it makes things even slower. So the idea of mm -hmm. Bloom was to have an open source large language model, uh, which would be public and uh, every researcher could use it and maybe even uh, any company could mm -hmm. use it. And uh, yeah, that's the idea of the Bloom project. There are many researchers who worked on uh, Bloom. So there are something like 1,000 researchers, I believe. A large collaboration, not yeah. only in France. No, it's from around the world, actually. Many institutes or even uh, companies worked on it. And it was trained here on Jean Zay. We provided the hardware and uh, provided the software. And it uh, ran for like three months. I think uh, you, you said everything, approximately. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, something that I can add. It's Hugging Face, which is... a uh, an American company who initiates the project and they ask so Idris for the resources, which is the most expensive part. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> why uh, most of companies keep the model for themselves. It's because it costs a lot to make that kind of model. Maybe we can talk about this, what it actually takes to create a model. Nowadays, I assume that you don't exactly start from scratch, do you? Yeah. You have some kind of basis. So to train that kind of model, just the final training part. So I'm not talking about the development, which mm. still needs resources, but just the final training part, it's 400 GPUs for three months running continuously. So it's quite a lot. Just as an electrical bill <laughs> about it, it's <laughs> <laughs> tremendous. But there's a development part. Thankfully, Big Science so started two years after the release of GPT-3. So there was a lot of research about that kind of big model that was made. So Big Science, thanks to that research, they could have a good start. You know, they already have some kind of architecture in mind. So they just reduce the list of hyperparameter to a few things that they tried. And then when they saw which combination of hyperparameter was the best, they just trained it for three months. Can we talk about the architecture of Bloom? Back in the day, so I'm talking about 10 years ago, which is basically archaeology uh, for deep learning, <laughs> we would use recurrent uh, neural network. So mm -hmm. basically uh, a network which uses its own output as an input. 
But then some people uh, found a new architecture called transformers. And by stacking them, you would have a very powerful tool to uh, understand uh, the semantic of a sentence. And it could handle uh, very long sentences. And there are basically two kinds of transformers. Either you take the whole sentence, and when you're analyzing a word, you take into account previous words as well as next words. But you also have um, the most modern version, which only takes into account previous words. It's less information, but in return, it's very powerful to make generating content. When your task involves generation, it's very strong. Basically, the other kind cannot do uh, text generation as well because they require the next words because that's how they were trained and they are used to having access to next words. So you cannot really do text generation with this kind of transformers. Basically, it's good for uh, text analysis. Yeah, the newer large language model, so the GPT kind, which are stacks of what are called decoders. They are very good at generating content. And basically, almost every task can be turned into a generation task. So they can basically do anything. Can we clarify what we mean by decoder? The first transformer had two stacks of your network. And uh, one was supposed to be the stack of encoders and one uh, the stack of decoders. And basically, if you're trying to uh, translate a sentence from French to English, The stack of encoder would take the French sentence mm -hmm. and try to understand its meaning regardless of the language. In the middle, you would have a, a representation of the sentence regardless of the fact that it comes from French. And then you would have the stack of decoder, which would take this representation and decode it in English. What kind of applications do you have in mind when you think of Bloom? So Bloom is a large language model. And uh, I like to see large language model like an engine. You can do... How can I say the application I'll see it has a car and mm. uh, Bloom will be the engine. So basically with the large language model, you can do almost any application regarding text. So for example, if you want to um, have a translation task, Bloom can do it. Actually, he's pretty good at uh, translation because he was trained on several languages. Well, you can make a chatbot like ChatGPT with it. You can have a better motor research engine. Yes, anything that can touch to text. How many languages does it actually support? Yeah, it's. I think it's 46 around the, so something. Mm. Uh, approximately, it's 46 languages that it was trained on. But what's interesting, because we trained it on a large amount of text, actually there was some, even in the French part or the English part, there was some uh, part of the text which was in another language that it was not trained on. And for example, when uh, we did uh, the evaluation, one of the researchers saw that it kind of do some Italian language uh, mm. processing. Pretty good, not obviously, uh, it's not the best, but it can understand a bit of Italian, even if Italian was not part of the language that it was trained. The Bloom model, is it currently being used by researchers only, or is it also, you mentioned industry participation, is it also used by companies? Uh, recently, Sambanova, which is a company that makes hardware, and Together, which is a collaboration of several uh, researchers and engineers, mm -hmm. used Bloom to make a chatbot, which is called Bloom Chat. So I think that's the first company that uses it, well, of what I know. Yeah. But I know that a lot of researchers uh, use Bloom for either comparison or evaluation or other tasks, yes. The next thing that I would like to touch on is high-performance computing and at what stage in the process high-performance computing is needed and required for dealing with large language models such as Bloom. When you're training uh, any kind of neural network, so you're doing a lot of linear algebra and it was found that GPUs are very, very good at doing that. But then your neural network uh, needs to fit within the memory of the GPU. And yeah, even if the GPU is very powerful, bigger networks cannot be trained on a single GPU. And modern GPUs are very powerful. They, uh, they have a lot of memory and they go really fast. But uh, large language models, it's just another scale. We cannot train a large language model uh, on a single GPU or very tiny large language model. <laughs> You need at least uh, dozens of GPUs to train them, mm -hmm. just to fit in memory and to have your answer, the output of the network within a reasonable amount of time. So Bloom were used 400 GPUs. So if 
and you're not doing a training process as intensive, you can go lower. If you need, you can go even higher. I believe uh, GPT-3 used uh, a 1,000 GPUs. Okay. Yeah, just for inference, uh, Bloom cannot fit within one uh, GPU if you're uh, using the raw uh, version of the model. So even for uh, inference, you require eight GPU, if I, I believe. They are just that big, and there is no way around it. Okay. <laughs> which, of course, is why we're here in Idris, which has the supercomputer Jean Zé. Yes, exactly. A supercomputer like Jean Zé, it's needed because, as Nessan said, will divide the model into several parts, mm. which will be in several GPU. And we need that the connection between the, those GPUs are very fast. Otherwise, it will take way too long to train. So that's why we need a supercomputer and not something like AWS, which has the number of GPU, but usually the connection between the GPU are pretty slow. Oh, right. Ah, okay. Well, that's another aspect that I wanted to touch on because there are now services like AWS, which you mentioned, that offer these kind of GPU services. But we still need these kind of research centers because they still have shortcomings in terms of speed and performance. Is that what you're saying? I think now AWS proposed that kind of services, mm -hmm. so uh, several GPUs that are very well connected together, but for our price, that will be uh, very, <laughs> yes. very, very uh, important, obviously. So that's why we need like supercomputer, especially if uh, you do research, for example, in France, you maybe don't have uh, that money to spend. No. Well, or so anywhere else for that yeah. matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Mm. The training, you mentioned it takes about three months, yes. uh, having a large language model trained. So how do you make sure, do you wait for three months to find out what the outcome is and how the performance of the model is? Or how does this work? Basically, uh, there is not one Bloom model, there are actually uh, multiple Bloom models and smaller ones. So you start from the smallest, then you gradually increase the size of the large language model. So you can see uh, issue uh, appear uh, by one by one. And even when you're training the uh, final model, the biggest one, you're still monitoring uh, what's going on. Almost every large language model did find some issues during the training process because maybe uh, the loss, the error was uh, mm. skyrocketing at, at some point and needed to do some uh, modifications to avoid that. So it is uh, monitored very closely. It's three months, but it's also three months with a lot of GPUs. <laughs> so uh, it, overall, it's one million uh, compute hours. So mm. uh, you do not want to waste that. That's why it's, yeah, it's uh, watched very closely. What happens when you do find a problem with it? Do you then stop and start again? Or what happens then? No, actually, the state of the model during the training are saved several times. Okay. So when we monitor, when we see that there's a problem, for example, in the last, we can go back to the, la the previous state that we saved, check what was the problem, handle it, and then continue from that part. Obviously, if we have a, a problem like at two months and a half, <laughs> it wouldn't be uh, good to just start again. So that's what uh, we are doing. Okay, so you're monitoring that basically on a daily basis or on an hourly basis or yes. a continuous basis. Exactly, yes. How do you measure the performance then? Well, the performance of the model, right? So after the training, mm -hmm. it's actually pretty hard. We need to do a full evaluation and it's what we are still doing, actually. So that kind of model, just for a little history, when the model, the large language model was not that large, so it was a few million or just a, a bit of a billion, we usually fine-tune the model on a specific task, mm. and then we evaluate that task. So we have a metric score, and then we compare it to uh, other uh, language model that was fine-tuned to that task too. But now the models are very large, so just fine-tuning to one task, it's very costly. Now the usual way to measure the performance of the model, it's by doing what we do, either zero-shot learning, few-shot learning. So actually, it's because it's a generative model, it can generate text, so we can ask to do anything. Mm -hmm. So we'll ask directly the model to do a task, and we'll measure the metrics for example, we have a list of review and we want to know if the model recognizes the review to be positive or negative. So we just give him the review and ask him, is it positive or negative? And then see what he's generate and uh, compute the accuracy with that output. 
the test data set that you actually use the basis must be absolutely huge now because you have 46 different languages and text. So where do the data actually come from for all of this? And is this changing continuously? Yeah, you have 46 uh, languages and for each language you have multiple tasks which you want mm-hmm. to uh, to test. So it could be a sentiment analysis or a summary or anything. So uh, yeah, you have a lot of data. Where do they come from? So it depends. So for instance, if you want to do sentiment analysis, it's quite easy because Amazon or IMDB do, uh, have uh, big data sets uh, which mm-hmm. are perfect for this. If you want to do summary, you can check on social networks. Maybe they can have some things like... Yes, yeah, that's a very difficult task and uh, it's very expensive actually to uh, sometimes do the labeling. So that's why you try to uh, avoid this part as much as possible. And uh, some companies, they have access to a special kind of data sets, which they Mm. can make public to help the research in this field. So for the multiple languages, what's interesting is that not all of them are uh, common. So obviously, uh, there are very common languages like French, English, Chinese, and so on and so forth. But you also have very rare languages some kind of African uh, languages which are not very used anymore. You do Mm. not have a lot of resources on those languages, but they are interesting because you want to know how good the model is to understand a a language on which it does not have a lot of data based on the other languages. So you may have uh, common points and Mm -hmm. uh, you want to see how easy or how hard it is to understand a new language. So I do not know uh, for all of them, but I assume that test data sets are much smaller and it is uh, obviously uh, way harder this way to test them. But yeah, there are multiple uh, test data sets. So for Bloom, I do not know the number exactly, but there are dozens of tasks which are uh, tested. Okay, maybe we can spend some time talking about your own projects. Plug AI, maybe we can start with that, Hatim. What is it and how would you describe that? So it was a project initiated by Creatis. We, I can say, hired uh, me and another co-worker at Idris, which is Kamel Garda, to help them to make that tool. The aim of that project is to help researchers and doctors who are not specialized in AI to do segmentation on medical image. The training, the evaluation, all that process, uh, we tried to make it easy for researchers. The aim of that project was also to have one tool that can be used for people who are not used in AI, but also for people who uh, know a bit more of AI but want to use a model that was trained by uh, a doctor who is who don't know AI but want to modify it a bit, mm-hmm. so we had to make it flexible. So that was uh, the aim of Plug AI. Is that any medical image like X-ray and then you go to MRI and CT and echo and uh, ultrasound, I mean? Or is that specifically for particular types of medical images? Actually, it can be made by any medical image, 2D or 3D. So you just need to have the data set. If you have the data set in the right format, uh, it's okay. Okay, excellent. Nathan, Nathan, I should actually say. (laughs) Yeah, so the project which I have uh, with uh, ICM, so the Brain Institute, the software is called Clinica. My part was about making the computation faster and also um, the software uh, much easier to use, basically because it's a software which is driven by research. Not every uh, features are, are thought about at the very beginning. It's added one at a time, and uh, sometimes you need to rework the code, so it is uh, easier to do modifications. I'm helping uh, their team do that, and also adding uh, new features about the high-performance computing parts, which at Idris we know very well. So uh, mm-hmm. it could be about doing uh, what's called automatic mixed precision. So instead of doing all the computation with four bytes, Some of them can be uh, done with two bytes, which is much faster and uses less memory. Also, the fact that you could use multiple uh, GPUs uh, will Mm -hmm. be introduced uh, in the software. Even the simplest way of doing distribution, which is replicating the model on multiple GPUs, but giving them multiple samples of the data set, can speed up the training process by a huge factor, actually. So, uh, yeah, I'm working uh, on this software, which also does uh, some pre-processing on a brain MRI. Okay, uh, But mm-hmm. that's not my part, so I cannot really uh, talk about it uh, much. Mm-hmm. I'm on the uh, deep learning part. The high-performance computing bit is something that I would like to talk about. So what kind of frameworks do you use to actually distribute code on different GPUs, and how does this work? 
usually the base framework that we use it's PyTorch, which is very known uh, by the community. Mm -hmm. But for distribution, we use several other tools that are built usually on top of PyTorch to make a distribution uh, more efficient. So we can say, for example, Megatron, which is a tool built on the top of PyTorch and which make uh, parallelism very efficient. And when we say parallelism, it's data parallelism, but also model parallelism. Model mm -hmm. parallelism, it's to cut the model into pieces and put it on some GPUs. Uh. So we can mention DeepSpeed, mm -hmm. which also do some distribution, but in a different way of uh, Megatron. Maybe, I don't know if I go into detail <laughs> about that, but it does uh, what we call the zero, which is a way to cut not the model, but the optimizer state. Mm -hmm. well, actually, I think there's a state where he cut the model too, but it's all about splitting the memory usage into several GPU and do it very efficiently. So recently there was Colossal AI, which was released. Its aim is to do what uh, Megatron and DeepSpeed and other framework does, but in a more easy way and a more flexible way because uh, Megatron and DeepSpeed are not uh, very uh, user-friendly, if I can say. Uh, the final question that I have then, if people are interested in getting into this, you mentioned you learned it yourself with these Mars online courses such as Coursera's with Andrew NG. What would you recommend? How would you start with all of that? Now, artificial intelligence is very widespread. We talk about it in the media basically all the time. So there are many, many, many courses about every type of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. on a very uh, famous uh, websites like Coursera or Udemy. You can definitely find mm -hmm. uh, what you need or even free resources, uh, which are very, very good and give you the theoretical aspect <laughs> and the mathematical part of the, the field. Maybe you will not have a, a very practical usage of uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence, but with the internet, you have an infinite uh, amount mm. of resources and it is very easy to have a uh, at least a base understanding of how it works. And for a deeper understanding, it will take a, a bit more work, but all the resources are available. And even a, a, f a few universities uh, do publish their courses. I believe Harvard or Stanford do it. It is a, a gold mine. Uh, and of course, Idris itself has an online course on YouTube, which we are going to share in the episode notes. It's going yeah. to be in French, but it's, it's, yeah. it's there. We have multiple courses. So the online one is called Fiddle, but we also have uh, courses which we do here at Idris. And the purpose of these courses is the fact that in French, the audience is basically PhDs and doctors in uh, France, which are from uh, many different fields. So maybe if you're a biologist or ke chemistry, you maybe you have never used uh, deep learning, but uh, deep learning is very efficient in some of those fields. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are teaching them. The other part, of course, is then high performance computing, which I think is more specialized and training opportunities might be a little bit less widely spread as they are for machine learning or artificial intelligence. Hatim. Yes, actually, the resources about HPC in AI are very rare. Even mm. the documentation of the tool that I mentioned it earlier are not that good. <laughs> so uh, to learn about it, it's very hard. First, to mention it, here at Idris, we provide a courses about it. We call it DLOJZ. <laughs> It's a course uh, specialized in uh, actually high performance training and inference of deep learning model. In our course Fiddle, we have one session about that actually to a software acceleration and hardware acceleration. But except of that, to be honest, I don't know uh, any courses uh, where we, you can learn the distribution of the model of the data, etc. Also to practice that kind of method, you need a lot of GPUs well, and you need access to high-performance computing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and not a lot of people obviously have access of that yeah. because it costs a lot, so it's very hard. That's why the courses that we do at Idris, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know any other courses uh, where you can do that, actually, because we train the students are working directly with Jean Zé, so they mm. are trying directly the method that we teach them, so... Okay, and we're going to look at Jean C next, which unfortunately the listeners can't, uh, yes. can't see, but <laughs> <laughs> I will be. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time today. Well, that thank was you. Very interesting. Thank you. As I've mentioned just now, after our interview ended, Hatim and Nathan took me downstairs to show me Jean Z, the supercomputer itself, 
entering the room requires special permission and a set of good earplugs, because the sound of the machine can be deafening. The machinery is of course very impressive, and Natan and her team showed me some parts, like GPUs and other goodies. It was a great and impressive tour, and I'd like to thank both for their welcome and their time. There is, as I mentioned as well, a lot of excitement in the air around artificial intelligence and machine learning at the moment. As the team mentioned during our chat, there are plenty of courses for you to choose from, including the now legendary one from Andrew and G at Coursera, which is still running and ever-expanding. Getting into high-performance computing, on the other hand, is not quite so straightforward, because for one, it's a question of access and being able to work and learn on one. There are a few courses available, usually running computing and research centres. In the UK, the Universe HPC project is working to provide pathways for teaching, learning and education. If you happen to be in France, there's a great YouTube channel called Fiddle. You'll find the link in the episode notes, along with other links. And finally, for those wondering who Jean Zé is, or rather was, and why a supercomputer was named after him. Jean Zé was the Minister for Education and Fine Arts of the Third French Republic during the 1930s. He was imprisoned by the Vichy regime during the Second World War and assassinated in 1944. His political convictions and his contributions to national education earned him a place in the Pantheon in Paris in 2015, and it got his name on a supercomputer just a few years later. And with that, goodbye. Oh, time's up. See you next time. But before I forget, this podcast is covered by the Creative Commons license. See ya.